Greetings viewers, Eric the Car Guy here and thank you very much for tuning in today and I'm excited for you because today you're going to get to see some cool stuff and specifically what I'll be working on is the 2003 Honda Pilot that I've been working on in the past few episodes and if you missed those episodes what I've done is I have removed the engine and transmission assembly from the vehicle on the custom built cart that I made and also replaced the transmission. I also uh, did a bunch of stuff to the front suspension and in this particular episode I'm going to be turning my attention to the engine where I plan to replace the timing belt and water pump components, uh, adjust the valves, do some other engine servicing. I've got some electrical repairs. Also there's uh, some reconditioning of the valve covers that I do. Tons of useful information that I hope you're going to find educational and informative. But rather than me standing here talking about it, why don't you watch the video? So take it away, Eric. There was one more thing I did before putting the pilot uh, up in the air for what I hope will be the last time before the installation of the engine and transmission. And that is I replaced the passenger side engine mount. I might have mentioned at some point that uh, the passenger side engine mount, if you're doing a timing belt and water pump on a J-Series engine, is probably something you should definitely consider as part of that job. Uh, they're often broken like this one was, and it was broken pretty badly. Anchor Industries was gracious enough to provide me with one for replacement. I replaced it and installed it back in the vehicle, but I left the through bolt loose so that I could install the engine and then uh, flop down the uh, rest of the bracket after the engine was installed so that I could reattach it. It's time to get this thing ready to install and to do that I have to reconnect all the electrical connectors, connectors and everything else in here. Now one thing to note, uh, you see this big uh, red plug here, there's a speed sensor that goes here similar to what I did down here, in fact it's the same type of speed sensor. I'm not going to install it yet and the reason for that is this. Uh, I believe I mentioned the update that we did to these transmissions years ago, which involved it putting this tube where the fill plug goes uh, to lubricate second gear. But it's kind of a pain in the butt, as you just saw, for me to pull this out. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill the transmission where the speed sensor goes. I'm just going to leave that open. It's the same size opening. Who cares? But there's a few brackets and things that I painted that I need to install, but pretty much if you lay things out, they should lay where they're supposed to go. Also, connectors are often color-coded the same color as the thing that they're connected to, so that is also helpful. But that's what I'm going to do now, is get this thing pretty much ready to go back in. Here it is. Everything is pretty much plugged in and connected. A lot of things, well, some of these things were broken uh, by my predecessor, so there's not much I can do there. I always try to put things back where I find them, but hey. One thing to note is I did put the vent back on that attaches down here. When I put the thermostat housing on, and thermostat housings on Hondas can be tricky. They're aluminum, they go into aluminum and corrosion is a factor. This lower fastener I had some issues with, so I did everything by hand. In fact, if you are doing thermostats on Hondas, I strongly recommend doing things by hand just to make sure that, well, you don't cross thread it. Because if you do, then you gotta replace this whole piece or you gotta fix it. It's, it's kind of a, a thing. Also, there's a ground on the thermostat housing down here. I actually cleaned that ground. Uh, before attaching it so that it was nice and secure. Also, the starter is back on, and you might remember my positive cable was messed up. I had a ground cable that was broken here. The ground cable that went down to the bottom is all wasted. And I started with the smaller ground by disconnecting the end that was still attached to the engine. Just for the heck of it, before I did the repair, I decided to check the resistance of the old ground cable and found that it was just a little bit over half an ohm. I decided to compare that reading to a new ground cable, which came out at 0.7 ohms, which considering that the new ground cable was a lot longer, I felt that that was okay. Next, I found a lug of the correct size that fit the cable and the fastener that attached to the engine. 
The strands on the end of the cable that I was about to repair were dirty, so I took them over to the wire wheel to clean them up. When I got them back to the bench, I followed that up with some contact cleaner. A clean electrical connection is a good electrical connection. After cleaning, I installed the new lug with this cool special tool that I have for doing this very thing. After installing the lug, I checked to see if it was securely fastened to the wire, and it was. My only regret is that I didn't add a little bit of shrink tube to cover the exposed wire before the connector. After the cable was complete, I checked its resistance, and it came out, again, a little over half an ohm. After that, I turned my attention to the main ground cable, and I started by clipping off the battery terminal end because there was actually two cables in one. I then cut some insulation off of the short cable so that I could easily insert it into the new battery terminal. After that, I took the old cable, laid it up against some new cable so that I could get the correct length, and then I marked it. This way I could roughly ensure that the new and the old cable were about the same length. I picked out a new lug for the new cable and then took it over the transmission and made sure that the fastener was going to work with the lug that I had chosen. The fastener fit a little bit loose inside the lug, but I knew it wouldn't matter once I tightened everything down. After that, I trimmed about a half an inch of insulation off of the new cable, being very careful not to damage any of the strands underneath. After fitting the new lug onto the new cable, I used my lug installation tool to install it. Once again, I checked the connection to make sure that it was secure, and it was. And on this cable, I did go back with some shrink tube and cover up the exposed copper. With that terminal end complete, I switched my attention to the other end, which I also trimmed about a half an inch of insulation off the cable, but didn't pull it completely off of the wire. I'm leaving that for when I install it into the new battery cable. With that work complete, I checked the resistance of the cable, which came out to a little less than half an ohm, and I was pretty happy with that. By the way, these are the new battery terminals. I'll link these along with parts and tools and things down in the description. So check there if you have questions. There's another electrical connection that I'd like to repair, and that is the feed for the AC compressor. That's my bad. When I uh, lifted the body up off the engine, uh, well, I forgot to unplug it. All is not lost because this is still intact, this part of the connector. All I need to do is reinstall this. Now you can't just pop it back up on there. In the center of this, you'll see this little white piece of plastic and pull this out. That's the lock. So take that, set it aside for the moment. You gotta try to figure out, well, really what the orientation is, how this should be inserted into uh, the back of the connector. Basically, you wanna get it in there till it clicks and hopefully that plastic that held it in place isn't uh, too badly damaged. Yeah, it looks like it might go in like that because the plastic or the little plastic tab is right up towards the top there. And then the part that it goes into is that little indentation there. And also, there's a little rubber weather pack seal on the bottom of this. This is why I want to reuse it, because it should help preserve that seal. Okay, you can see the metal protruding, so it's still good. And then you got to put this back in exactly how you took it out. It goes back in like that. That should fix that. Make sure you see the terminal down inside there. And if you do, and it's secure, you should be okay. But when you connect it, be sure it doesn't push out the back. That was almost the last electrical thing I was gonna mess with. The last thing is gonna be this intake air temperature sensor, which I, I don't know what this is, but oh man, and you cut it so close to the connector. I don't like you, whoever was here before me. You really tried, didn't you? Goodbye, hackery. I think there's just enough here to salvage, like just enough. I'm gonna trim it back a little, but I think I have just the thing for this. Since this insulation is also damaged on the screen wire, I'm just gonna fix them both. Be close, but I think it'll work. It's shrink tube, and there's a little bit of solder on the inside of it. I use these quite often, because you're soldering the connection, and there's shrink tube, and it like does it all at once. And try to get the solder in the middle. Once you see the solder melt, you're done. I think we averted disaster there. 
Let's wrap this up. Let's see what I did there. No more of whatever that was. Next up, let's get this engine serviced so we can get this thing back in the pilot, start it up, drive it, see how it works. To begin that process, I'm gonna start by removing the intake. This is fairly typical of what I find on this generation J series. Uh, I call this the ant farm and it's the EGR passage for in here. And then there's these six holes that go into each individual cylinder, but these can get clogged up, which I'm going to soak this with some throttle cleaner is very good at, at dealing with this. Soak this in some throttle cleaner while I do the other work uh, to get this cleaned out. This gasket can totally be reused. Just be careful with it. Uh, but I'm also going to clean the gunk off of this. And you should clean down inside of each one of these holes because uh, you can see they're already starting to clog up. Before I do the soaking, I'm just going to knock the big chunks out. And I'm just using a flathead screwdriver for this. You can use whatever works. Later models refine this design and you don't need to clean them as much. Seem to collect quite a bit at these angles where they bend. And at the very end. I would be looking to do this probably about every 60,000 miles or so on an older engine like this. I'll clean this after I remove it from the engine so that I don't have anything fall down into the engine. Uh, this is easily removed with the 12 millimeter fasteners that hold it on. Don't want to forget about that electrical connection that I just repaired. Also the PCV valve, which I'm going to use two hands to get this up out of here because I don't, this is a plastic valve. I don't want to break it. Now keep in mind, my throttle body is already removed. If it isn't, well, you got some stuff to remove, uh, including disconnecting the EVAP system. And there may be some other stuff you need to deal with there. But once you've dealt with all that, you should be able to just lift the intake up off of there. Now I'll clean this out. Uh, the EGR passage and everything in here. And actually, you know what? I want to try something really quick. This is a, uh, an experiment for the future. This engine has a spacer in the intake. You see, it's about that thick. And I want to see if it will work. The intake will go on without it. So there's a coolant line here that's coming into contact with it that I'm just going to gently bend out of the way. Looks to me like it sure can. Why does this matter to me? Well, you might remember I will be installing a supercharger on this engine, and along with that supercharger, I want to install an intercooler. In order to do that, I'm gonna need space because there's not a whole lot of space under the hood. The thickness of this is about the same as the intercooler that I wanna use, and I know that the supercharger will fit on the intake as it is now. So. I can add my intercooler and my supercharger knowing that I can remove this. Now, this is in there to increase intake runner length, which helps increase bottom end torque. I'm not going to be as concerned about that with a supercharger, so this can go away in favor of the uh, intercooler, which is going to net me more power than this ever would. Let's get this guy cleaned up. Sometimes I forget about the cool things I have around here. I'm just going to run these through the parts washer. Uh, to really get them cleaned up. And I'm just going to let that soak in there and we'll be back. I ran out of the spray stuff, so I'm using this. Had some of this laying around and this uh, chip brush. I'm careful not to get too much down in here. You can lock up the cylinders. Now it'll be a minute before I fire this up before the first time and I'll be rotating the engine around to do the uh, valve adjustment. So I'm not too worried about locking up the cylinders, but should definitely be something you consider. Wow, that works like magic. Like literally like magic. I wager that this thing's gonna smoke like a freight train when I start it up, but this, the insides of this engine are gonna be clean. And by the way, when these get clogged up enough, the individual cylinders can get a misfire under load if they're not getting EGR, and you could get a code for low EGR flow. Uh, if this gets clogged up. Now we'll bust out the carbon buster. This isn't exactly how this stuff is supposed to be used, but it's working. Obviously I'm gonna be here a while, so we'll just check back in when I'm uh, all cleaned up and ready. 
As long as we're working on intake stuff, this is the throttle body. I did uh, clean the inside of it using the same methods that I showed earlier. This on the bottom is the idle air control valve. And I wanna go inside here and clean this out also. These can be tricky to get off. They're Phillips head screws. And I'm using, well, a type of screwdriver that I can put a wrench on just to see if that'll help. I may have to employ other methods. The only way to really get these off is off the vehicle. Sometimes you get codes for them or what have you. So I'm gonna go get, well, a different tool. The shake and break. I have the plastic jaws installed on my vise so as to not to damage the aluminum. But I don't wanna squeeze it too tight because I could damage it anyway. Vice grips can also work. Penetrating oil, because we do not want to break this screw. Gonna wire wheel that guy before installation. Going easier. Now there's a rubber gasket in here. Good, it's intact. If this gets dried out, eesh, but it's still good. I'm just very carefully going to remove it. Excellent, and now we can clean this out. Now cleaning out these valves goes a long way towards smoothing out the idle. I'm just gonna let that soak. So all that time I had this soaking in that parts washer, it did virtually nothing. This is just working in seconds. Looks way better than when I started. After cleaning, it looks pretty good. I blew it out with some compressed air to get rid of the rest of what was in there, but that's a result. The screw seems fine. I believe I mentioned I was gonna take this one over the wire wheel. I'm gonna do that real quick. I've also decided that a little bit of anti-seize isn't gonna hurt because these idle air control valves do go bad from time to time. And you saw what I needed to do to get this out. And one of the reasons I was so afraid of breaking the screw is because, well, I've done it. And it's not fun. That guy's ready to install. Next, I'd like to get these valve covers off so I can get those reconditioned. So this, well, I can handle it one of two ways. I cannot use it at all, which I think would be fine, or I could paint it. On this side, there's a connector for that coolant line right there, PCV. For my pressure washing, there's water in there. This will also give it some time to dry out. It was just that one so far. Do this before removing the plug to avoid getting water in the engine. It smells like it hasn't had an oil change in a while. Well, that's not bad at all. What do the spark plugs have to say? They say we need to be changed, but the fact that they're relatively clean and not covered with brown crust means that it's likely not burning oil, at least on this half of the engine. Dry, dry, also dry. Don't worry about that. It's just the transmission uh, mounts are not bolted down yet. 
That's all that is. Aha. This is somewhat typical of what I find on this generation of J-Series, and the rear cylinder head gets all this caked up stuff back here. The only thing that I could say is the PCV system is back here, the PCV valve is up here. Now I'm gonna reuse the one that was on here, and I know that sounds strange, but I haven't found anything in the aftermarket that works as good as a Honda PCV valve. Now I did take the one that was on here and I soaked it in some of that cleaner, and it's moving freely and it seems to be good, so I'm gonna roll with it. But know that you may find this uh, if you take uh, the valve covers off of a J-Series of this vintage. What I'd recommend is running high mileage oil for a while and not flushing the engine. You could cause more problems. And in fact, I'll post a video in the description uh, explaining that very thing. I think we'll get these plugs out. I'm going to get the valve covers cleaned up and ready for paint. Get, the, get a coat of paint on those and then we can adjust the valves. Don't like how that came out at all. That one either. Just not inspire confidence. Oh! So, what's left of that spark plug? A little bit of brown crusty on these two. But here's what I find with J-Series. Sometimes the front plugs will get changed and the back ones won't because they're kind of difficult to get to. These plugs may very well be older than the front ones. In fact, this uh, area you see here is totally normal. It's called the Corona. Looks like that's been in there a while, right? Well, let's compare it to uh, one of the other ones that I took out of the other side. Okay, this one on the left is the darkest one I could find in the front. Judging by how these electrodes are worn, I wonder if that was the case. I wonder if the front plugs got changed and the back ones didn't especially with as reluctant as that one was that came out. I know this might sound weird, but I do keep Play-Doh at the shop. I use this Play-Doh to check valve to piston clearance when building performance engines. <laughs> that worked excellent. All right, so if you've got little bits of spark plug that are left down inside a cylinder and you need to get it out, Play-Doh, you're welcome. I wanna recondition these valve covers. Get rid of all the rubber components since I'll be replacing the valve cover gaskets and everything good 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 that is acceptable i like to use these to pull out these uh spark plug grommets which i also have new ones of by the way like magic so happy that came out. I have had to literally take a chisel to get these out before. On this back one, there's the PCV valve grommet that I'd love to remove and I'd love for it to just cooperate. It's often my friend with other things, why not with this? not in the best shape but it's not broken I'm just gonna go at it with a uh, wire wheel and a uh, angled die grinder this is the catalytic converter that came off of this pilot uh, I had to cut it off you might remember it was all welded together I'm saving it because I'm gonna try to sell it at some point well we'll make a video about that when it's time and I'm not using safety glasses because of wire wheel instead face shield because these little guys come flying off and they're like little missiles you never know where they're gonna end up preferably not in your face welcome back viewers they look way better right well that wasn't just the wire wheel after I got done with the wire wheel I took them over to the sandblaster and then sandblasted them for a bit and then they went to the parts washer and I cleaned the undersides of them the best that I could. These things are almost ready for paint. I probably also should have said that I spent a good amount of time with compressed air to blow off as much of the uh, parts washing stuff, mineral spirits is what it is, as much of that as I could. 
Next step, I'm going to coat these with some prep spray, and this removes any wax or grease or residue, anything that can prevent the paint from adhering to the surface. It also prepares the surface for the new paint. And I like to do this, especially on stuff like this that's gone through like the uh, parts washer, stuff like that. That can actually make it so the paint doesn't stick right. And you can be liberal with this stuff, don't worry. Because it's going to wash away all the bad stuff. Just gonna let that sit till that stuff evaporates. And then we can lay some paint on it. Now I need to choose what paint I'm going to use to paint these valve covers with. I wanna paint them something similar to what was already on there. This seems pretty close. Uh, some of these other things might add some interesting contrast, but I think I'm gonna go with this Aluma Blast. I also went ahead and uh, painted that other piece that I said I wasn't gonna paint. Well, I ended up painting it anyway uh, after sandblasting it but these pieces will be ready to go back on after I get the valve covers done. And this whole process of cleaning up these valve covers did make quite a mess, like everywhere, everywhere. Still a little dampness on these valve covers and I wanna make sure that I clear out all the bolt holes because, well, that stuff won't evaporate very well. You'll probably see it spraying out here in a minute. Start with light coats and build up to it. Don't try to get it all on in one coat. Let that coat set up. I'll come back and do another. It's funny how you lay down that first coat and it's just a light coat, but you let it sit for a minute and it seems to look even better. So I guess it kind of spreads out for a minute after you lay the paint. I think one more coat will be there. I think with this Aluma Blast paint, it's probably a good idea to go light coats several. So I probably should have gone a little bit lighter on this coat and I wouldn't have had things like that little run happen. Now that's gonna be underneath the intake manifold, so no big deal, but you know, if it happens on the front, like it did right there a little bit, uh, it could be an issue. Looks better than it did. While that dries, I'm gonna work on the valve adjustment. Valve covers are off, everything's ready to go. Uh, the intakes on these are 22 or 0.22 millimeters and the exhaust are 0.30 millimeters. I'm just going to run through and uh, do this. I've done videos about valve adjustments on J series in the past. Link it in the description for you to check out. Valves are now adjusted. I've gone around and checked them twice just to be sure, and they are all just where I want them. The only thing really left to do is the timing belt and water pump stuff, and I've got some gaskets uh, for the VTEC solenoid and the stuff down here. There was a small oil leak there. I won't be able to put this thing back together and get it back in that pilot. Also, while I was doing that valve adjustment, these valve covers actually settled out nicely. I just added another very light coat, but those areas of concern, sort of leveled out. So that Eastwood Aluma Blast paint was pretty forgiving with me and I appreciate that. I couldn't resist and had to see what the valve covers looked like on the engine and I'm pretty happy. And they kind of make the rest of the engine look, look a little bit dumpy, especially these exhaust manifolds and the covers on the outsides of them. Again, I'm not too worried. I have future plans for this and it'll probably go away. In fact, uh, I am going to get the exhaust manifolds loose so that they're more easily removed, in particular dealing with this rusty stuff here. Before I go there, let's uh, install all the rubber seals and everything in the valve covers, put those back on. The valve adjustment's done. We can button this up and move on. I took this grommet for the PCV valve. It's starting to cool down now and put it uh, in front of my heater to try to soften it up a bit so that when I reinstall it, it actually does reinstall a little bit of silicone spray on the outside of it there we are could i have gotten a new one probably but i didn't think of it and i made that work so remember when these go in they need to go in like this so that the seal fits over uh, the uh, opening for the spark plugs so not like this they have to go in like this silicone spray can be helpful
That one's ready to install. Awesome. Let's do the other side and then I'll fasten everything down. Nothing fits like OE gaskets. They just go together. Nothing else does that, at least from what I've experienced. I also went through and wiped off this surface before installing these. And I'd previously gone through and uh, replaced all of these gaskets also. These are the part numbers for these. I think we're gonna need these spark plug thingies. This is just motor oil. I put a drop on them. Just a drop. NGK says to put nothing at all. So those of you that are putting anti-seize on there, in fact, they say specifically don't use anti-seize. I'm not even supposed to be using this oil. You'll probably still use the anti-seize too. Why are we so hard headed? It's gonna wipe these down a little bit before I put them in. These are just cleaning towels. Let's see what we can do with this exhaust manifold, if anything. Because the engine is out of the car, that's why I'm doing this now. I'm always grateful when it goes down like that. Just gonna put some penetrating oil on these, and all I wanna do is get them loose. That one came loose. Also loose. Also. Fantastic. Found a larger washer that I'm gonna use. Let's hope it goes the same on the back. So grateful. Oh, thank you, Honda, for using decent fasteners. With that, we're closing in the final things I wanna to do to the engine before installation. I've got a couple of oil seals here that I would like to replace, then the timing belt, water pump, and drive belts, and that's it. I'm not sure if oil's gonna come out of this or not, so I'm gonna put my rag underneath it. Although, this is gonna get oil on it every time I change the oil filter. I'm gonna start with this gasket underneath the solenoid. Just two 10 millimeters on the top. So there's that gasket, which I'm going to replace. They start to harden up like this, that's when they leak. Just to prevent dirt and debris from getting down in there. This is the part number for this guy. There's a little bit of oil residue there that I'm just gonna spread around on the gasket. I use quarter inch tools to avoid over torquing. I recommend you do the same. I don't know what the torque of this is, but I'm pretty sure it's probably in inch pounds. And this one is held on by three fasteners. This is the part number for this one. The longest bolt goes in this upper right. It probably could have been easier after I removed the crank pulley, but here we are. I'm gonna guess this is somewhere around 25 foot pounds as far as torque goes. Well, that chassis paint did not like that brake clean at all. This is the main oil feed for the engine after it passes through the filter. Uh, the filter right now is empty, but before I start the engine, I'm gonna fill the filter with oil. It's easy to get to now. That way it can feed the engine as soon as possible after I start it up for the first time. The time has come for the final bit of maintenance. 
time and belt and water pump. Now I've covered this in detail in other videos, so you're just gonna be like over the shoulder hanging out with me while I get this done. Very easily with it out of the vehicle, it's the way to do it. Although you need to go through all of this in order to get there. Well, that's job done with the timing belt and water pump replacement and just cleaning the timing covers made it look that much better. The only thing you didn't see me do yet is reinstall the dipstick tube and I waited uh, because I wanted to show you that I replaced the O-ring on that. Probably not a bad idea if you have this style to uh, replace the O-ring when you do this. I'm gonna put a drop of oil on this before I insert it. You also might have noticed whenever I did any cleaning or anything, I just briefly inserted the dipstick tube to prevent debris from getting down into the engine through the opening where it normally lives. Now I didn't spend as much time cleaning the intake manifold or the outside of the intake manifold as I did with like say the valve covers. Reason being is I would love to, before installing the supercharger, get this thing polished so it's polished aluminum. That would be cool. And I don't have time for that now, but this is easy to remove inside the vehicle, so I'm not worried. Not sure the torque on these, but I'd put it somewhere around the 25 to 30 foot pound range. It actually goes on easier that way, so make sure you put it on correctly. So if you're having difficulty putting it on, flip it over. For this intake gasket that has a very small piece missing here, I'm just gonna take a little bit of Honda Bond, and I've done this in the past. I thought I had another one of these gaskets, but I've got them for a different model vehicle. Anyway, this is gonna come in with just a little bit of Honda Bond, just as sort of a bonding agent. This will be one of those things that will get sort of replaced. Supercharger installation. Just a couple more things that I want to add before installing it. Uh, you might remember that intermediate shaft and axle on this side. Also, I have new lower control arms for both sides that I'd like to install as well. Don't want to forget to take out the plug. And I will transfer that over to the old transmission for shipping. And this one, the bolts with the shanks go on the bottom too. I have two brand new lower front control arms with new bushings, new ball joints and everything. I'll link it in the description for you. And I'll get these on there before I put the axles in. That way I don't have to fight with the axles. I'm not gonna tighten these all the way down until they are uh, fully installed in the vehicle and the weight of the vehicle is on the ground. Short one goes to the back, long one goes through the front. I think that pretty much wraps up the subframe work. I'm proud of that. That was a lot of work. It's gonna be quite difficult to attach one O2 sensor wire that goes from the catalytic converter up into this clip and up over here. Therefore, I'm gonna install my catalytic converter now and uh, with its gasket and run the wire up so I don't have to deal with that. Who put this shift cable in this exhaust? 
Oh yeah, that was me. And FYI, that teeny tiny leak you see there, that's not my weld. That's the previous person. I didn't do it. This still has a little bit of movement and I'm gonna leave that little bit of movement in there because I can come up and tighten this up after no problem. It's this O2 sensor wire I really want to get squared away. Like I said, that's gonna be a real pain to get to once all this is in the way. Well, viewers, I'm gonna call it there for this installment of the front end work that I've been doing on the 2003 Honda Pilot. Rest assured in the next episode, that engine and transmission will find their way back into that Pilot and I will start it up for the first time. That won't come without its own set of challenges and difficulties, I can assure you of that. Be sure to catch that video when it becomes available. I'll link it down in the description when it is available to make it easier for you to find. Also linked down in the description will be parts, tools, additional videos, additional information. So if you have any questions about anything you saw in this video, check the description. I will also put a link to airthecarguy.com, which is where I ask you to go if you have automotive questions that I didn't cover in this video. Aside from that, keep in mind that I post videos on Fridays, so stop back and see me then. Be safe, have fun, stay dirty. Thank you very much for watching today, and I'll see you next time.